All right, everybody, so it's Rob back with another video. So I was playing around with the idea of taking the watercolor paper that I've shown you all how to stain and do uh, all these wonderful things with and then be able to use it for charcoal. And I started thinking charcoal is black and white, and so therefore it's a bunch of gray tones. And that had me thinking, you know, a charcoal drawing is essentially a grisaille or a grisaille, uh, which is French for gray tones. And uh, I said, you know, what, what the heck, let me do a, a charcoal drawing. And the idea was to go over it with uh, final fixative, and that way it won't smudge uh, or get damaged anyway. So that's what I ended up doing. And what that final fix it does, it just lets me put the clear gesso on top of it. And I ended up doing three layers of that. And what that did was um, it gave me a ground to work on. Because you have to put something on watercolor paper to be able to paint on. You got to put gesso, uh, some sort of primer. So. For those of you that don't know, gesso comes in white. That's the typical gesso we all are used to seeing. It also comes in black. Uh, I've also tinted white gesso by adding burnt umber, burnt sienna, whatever. Uh, acrylic, obviously, because it's acrylic gesso. Um, but years ago, I discovered clear gesso, which I didn't know that even existed. So it's completely clear, it's transparent, and Basically, I put that over this drawing after I used the spray fixative so it wouldn't, you know, because if you just did the gesso, I, I always add a little bit of water to my gesso and that would smudge the charcoal. So to prevent that from happening, after I'm done drawing, I spray fix. And then after the spray fix dries, I do a, probably a good two coats of spray fix uh, just to hold the charcoal on the surface. And then when that dries, I go over it with at least three coats of clear gesso and then after you know that dries I'll uh, I'll start the oil painting so essentially what you saw me doing this drawing is the same setup or put the highest point and the lowest point that I look for the mouth line the bottom of the nose the top of the eyebrows and just kind of play around with that this is actually I just used a photograph of an old guy that I just had on my computer for years. And uh, I think I want to say I got it from Unsplash, but I, I honestly don't remember. Um, and then I played with it. I didn't uh, I didn't work so hard to try to make it look like the guy. Uh, I, just, I just wanted an old guy. So I just used the basics of what I saw in the photo. And that's a really great way of experimenting and practicing without going through the, the all the trials of you know having to make it look perfect and you know it has to look like the guy and everything else so that just saved me a ton of time and it uh, it made it more fun and uh and if he had you know just no hat or anything in this case i put in a turban just because i i love turbans and all that just because it makes it a lot more fun and so here's the finish uh, the first pass what it looked like and there's the palette that I used I had used basically I believe was just um, just a burnt umber or raw umber or something like that and um, I kept it for the first pass just very you know pretty relatively dark um, as I tend to do sometimes and I used the uh, I want to say it was yellow ochre and vermilion red and that gave me a skin tonish, but it was still too dark and too grayed out. But I didn't care. It was just a first pass sort of thing, just to get something down. And then here, this is the uh, this process that you're seeing now is uh, vermilion red for the uh, the turban, which I ended up not liking it it wasn't bright enough uh i mean it wasn't dark enough 
and uh, that first pass, uh, you probably can't tell on the video, but it was much too thin, as I tend to do. I work rather thin on my first pass uh, with mineral spirits as my medium. And the reason I do that is because it, it dries faster. And then I go over everything again on the second pass. And usually the second pass is just straight paint with maybe just a hint of the medium, uh, or excuse me, the, uh, the odor of mineral spirits as a medium. And that's it. Or sometimes I'll use a little oil mixed, you know, 50 50 with my medium. Just depends. And so the red turban. I made some of the light spots by adding a little bit of, I believe was a little bit of, I mixed up an orange with some red and yellow, or I think I just used straight yellow ochre. Uh, and the reason is you don't want to use white uh, on red uh, by itself because you'll get a pink. And so it'll look, you know, it, it won't look right sometimes, you know, it'll look pink rather than a spot, like a spot of white. So what you want to do is try to use something else uh, that's a, a light color. And so to keep it from becoming pink, I just added a little yellow to my vermilion red. And that got it to become a slightly lighter red. And that's what I ended up using in the, uh, in the highlighted area. I didn't highlight it a whole lot. I just want to brighten some spots to add a little bit of form that sense of depth and, and, and shape and give it, you know, you feel that turban turning on his head, going into the shadows, coming out of the shadows, coming into the light. So, you know, I didn't want to make it overly bright because it just didn't really call for that. And I'm going with that, you know, old school Renaissance kind of looking painting with a dark background, the chiaroscuro uh, look that I enjoy so much want to look into that I, I highly suggest you look into uh, Chiaro Scudo painting and uh, there are many many masters that uh, of the Renaissance era that worked in that dark background dark surroundings and then very well lit objects that just gives it a much more interesting look in my opinion so I'm adding the uh, gray tones to the beard and I basically put just a dark gray when I first went through this. And when that, that had dried is when I sat down and did the red on the turban that you saw a few minutes ago. And then started adding some middle tones and some highlights to the beard. And I'm just putting in this, I guess you could call it second pass to the beard. But I'm not really uh, thinking that it's, it's a finished product at this point it's just it's still going to need uh, a third sitting all in all this painting probably took uh i, I want to say between the three different sittings that i did i want to say probably took about maybe five hours something like that maybe four or five hours i can't remember and uh and it, was, it was just a lot of fun I did use some uh, a 50/50 mix of uh, stand oil and mineral spirits to go over the background on the second sitting, and the reason was I needed to uh, kind of give the paper. It, it kind of tends to seal the, the the watercolor paper better, so the paint doesn't get sucked into the surface as much. Kind of gives it a little bit more light. So that when that dried, that got me to this stage where I'm adding the, what's gonna be basically the, the third, I believe it was, sitting and, and final sitting, um, the third stage here, where I'm adding color on top of the, the duller, darker, uh, browner, grayer looking tones that I did in the first pass. And uh, I just started from the forehead down, as I like to do, and the reason is, it's just easier and more comfortable for me as a right-handed person to work usually from top left to bottom right. Uh, if you're left-handed, you'd want to work from the top right of your canvas to the bottom left of the canvas. That way your hand's not going to rest on, uh, on wet paint. And uh, I think at some point you might see a mall stick. It's just a, 
a round dowel stick that's four feet long that I got at uh, the hardware store. And uh, I use that to rest on the top of my easel and then I rest my hand on it. And that way my hand doesn't have to sit on top of wet paint. The palette that I'm using for this is uh, below the painting. You can't see it, it's off camera. The colors that you're seeing to the right of the painting there, that is from another project I'm working on. And so don't don't think it, don't think that palette is what I used to paint because it wasn't. Uh, not for this project, for something else, it's a still off I'm working on. Um, but the palette I did use for this um, gentleman here, I used the vermilion red, the yellow ochre, ivory black, and titanium white. So basically the Zorn palette, which is my favorite palette. But I also used a mixture of burnt sienna with alizarin crimson, and then I lightened that up. And basically I, I'm working on different projects simultaneously, and I used a Zorn palette for one project, I believe it was uh, George Washington, uh, our first president, uh, portrait. And then uh, the burnt sienna palette I was using for a different portrait. And so I didn't want the paint to go to waste. And so I decided for this little imaginative guy that I just kind of came up with using a you know rough photo of reference where I just kind of threw together some proportions and slapped this whole thing together and then invented a, a turban. Uh, I didn't want that paint to go to waste, so I ended up using it on this gentleman here. But that's another way of saving paint. You know, you sometimes, you never want to mix exactly what you think you're going to need because you're always going to mix far too little paint. And that's just a nightmare because it's much harder to match a color rather than mix enough of it, you have leftovers so you can finish the paint. You don't want to be halfway through a face or a figure or whatever it is you're doing, you know, still life. And then now you got to figure out what the heck did you do? You know, how did you mix that green or that, you know, red ish color or whatever? And you don't remember. So, what I always tell people is, if you're smart uh, and, and you've got a lot of projects going on at, at the same time as you should, it's, oil paintings dry slow, so you got to work on several projects simultaneously just to stay busy and not have to wait, because you might have to wait a couple of days for your painting to dry before you can work on it again. So, you know, I would suggest trying different genres, you know, maybe a still life, maybe a portrait, maybe a different portrait or maybe a figure, and you might have four or five different things going on like I do. And then as you're mixing, you can then put the leftover paint with your paddle knife and scrape it over to, uh, there's different ways of doing it, but what I like to do is I'll put it on a glass, uh, a piece of glass that I take out of an eight by 10 frame and by putting it on glass, I then get like uh, some plastic wrap, like the stuff you use for your food. And I put a little bit of that over the paint so it doesn't dry out. And I'll put that in the freezer. And I'll put a little sticky note or something and on top of it and saying, you know, portrait of the young blonde girl, or whatever the title of your work might be. And then that, that way, when I'm ready to start working on that portrait or whatever the project is, all I gotta do is go grab that little tiny piece of glass. Um, also a piece of, a tile, like a little, you know, six by six ceramic tile. Well, actually, uh, I heard it will work, but I prefer the glass. Um, and then I just go to the freezer and take it out. And, hey, that's what I'm going to work on, and that's it. There's another additive I like to put into my paints um, when I squeeze it out of the palette. I'll put a few drops of something called clove oil. Clove oil is something you get like, usually like a pharmacy will have it. Um, it's not in the art stores, but um, 
it's, it smells like clothes, right? It smells really good, so it makes your, your studio smell good and your painting will smell good. But clove oil is going to retard the dry time of your oil. So oil is already dry relatively so, but some of the earth tones can dry overnight. So if you needed to keep your paints wet while your actual painting is drying, then that way the paints don't dry out when they're in the freezer, because even in the freezer, they'll preserve the paints and keep it wet longer. They can still dry out over time and uh, and still get hard and, and be useless. So what I would suggest is getting some clove oil, you can get it like a pharmacy or like the little spa area of the store. They use that like in spas and massage places when, you know, uh, I think they call it essential oils or whatever. So you can get that sort of thing there and then get yourself an eyedropper. You don't want to pour this stuff onto your paint because it will never dry. Okay? This is something I put, like I'll squeeze out a bunch of paint on my palette, say I'll squeeze out some vermilion, and I'll add a few drops of the clove oil. And then from that palette, that plastic uh, palette where I keep all my colors squeezed out and wet and ready to work, I also add to the paint a little bit more of um, either some stand oil or some uh, just regular uh, oil, painting oil, um, to just give it a little bit, that oil will actually add a little bit uh, of, of open time so it doesn't dry out, and the, clove, and the clove oil will make it where it really, really takes a long time. If you just stick to clove oil and um, and just do that, you're, you're, you're gonna be good. That paint's gonna take a long, long time for it to dry. And then what I do is I'll take my palette knife and I'll just scrape a little bit out of my palette, uh, but my big container palette, and then I just scrape some onto the palette that you see on my screen there, and I just take out little bits at a time that I need, and then mix up for whatever I'm working on. And what that does for me, it helps to, uh, to make working much more efficient for me, and uh, and it works. It's I've been doing that for a while, and that works for me. And if you want to try that, I suggest uh, that you do. But again, be very very careful, and only use a few drops. You know, you take some experimentation. The earth tones, uh, you know, burnt umber, raw umber, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, raw sienna, all the earth tones. They tend to dry the fastest, so those you could add a few extra drops, you know, four drops or something. It all depends on how much paint you squeeze out. And then you just take your paddle knife, you move it around, you know, kind of mix it up in there, and um, and you're good. And I've been doing that for years, and it works. And then to dry my paintings in between sittings, uh, what I like to do is I'll pop my paintings in the uh, my smaller ones into the oven, and I put it to bake. I know it sounds funny. But I'll put my oven to bake at the lowest temperature, which is like 170 or something like that, and bake it for, you know, say an hour or so. You don't want to do high temperature. You don't want to leave it unattended. So please don't go out for a walk or, you know, take a trip to the beach. You don't want to burn your house down. I've never had a problem with it. And uh, it will stink a little bit because of the chemicals or whatever, you know, that's in the paints. But uh, to me, that's a small price to pay for the added benefit of drying my painting out in, you know, a few hours rather than a day or two or three or four days or whatever. Especially when I put the uh, clove oil into the paints, that's going to basically make it dry really slow. So you're going to need to speed it up. You can buy a fast drying alkyd medium. You can use odorless mineral spirits like I like to use, which is also fast dry and then you can also add to that the oven technique if you want to call it that and that will also uh, help the speed time the, the dry time to speed up and so that's how I combat the whole clove oil making it dry too slow I do the mediums that I use and then putting it in the oven those things tend to 
then speed it back up again. And so usually I can start painting again either later on that evening or the next day. Uh, in most cases, it all depends on the colors that you're using. So here on the painting, I'm finishing up some of the tones. I started from dark to light, as I think you should be working. It helps to see the values better, I believe. And uh, I just went over the background with some burnt umber because the raw umber was a little too uh, too cold, so my burnt umber was a lot warmer. And I, I, I felt it was still too cold, so what I did, I went over the turbine and the background with alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson being a transparent color, it made it where when I went over the um, the background and the turbine, I ended up making the turbine a richer, darker red, and then it added some warmth to the background. So that's how you can warm things up when it comes to backgrounds or you can use something like ultramarine blue which will cool it down those are my two favorite colors when it comes to cooling or warming up a background and it, it works wonders and in this case i happen to need to change the uh, color of the turbine and make it slightly richer red so i didn't have to be so careful around the turbine i just went right over it and i just took a large blender brush and i just kind of mopped it around a little bit and, and smooth things out and you get the uh, you get the effect that I got there and the lights were showing enough through the fabric of the turbine that I just let it be I didn't, I didn't go in and add any more lights I probably should have but I like the way it looked and I said you know what the hell I'm just gonna leave it alone and uh, then I started right in with the beard and I just mixed up some uh, middle gray tones slightly darker gray tone and then a, uh, I didn't use Weika it's just too bright so I used a very light gray and that uh, that worked better than white so try to stay away from your super bright or your super dark so here's the finished product as you can see uh, it turned okay it turned out alright I did a dark background. I could probably do another layer of the burnt umber, but I felt that, you know, just as a practice for having fun, that it was good enough. So don't forget to uh, hit like and please subscribe. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.